So I brought the idea for today's episode to the table, and nobody pushed back. It would have been easy to lean into the stretch drive of the regular season. Instead, we're going to explore a part of our game that's growing in value right before our eyes. I'm really looking forward to introducing you to Dr. Alicia Nasser on the Chirp Podcast with Darren Millard. Boys, I'm Mike today. Just let everyone know, don't say anything stupid. Heads up! Oh, how does that feel, old man? What are you going to do? You! Ah! That's a disgrace! That's a disgrace! What a joke! Hit him, hit him, light him up, light him up. Yeah, nice hit! That's solid. My first words last week played off the great clips that just opened the show. How I love beaking in hockey. To give you an idea of the uniqueness of this episode of the Chirp Podcast, today we replaced that verbal jousting that I was talking about by digging into how the hockey world is improving the mental part of the game. Before you meet our guest, an admission. To consider me a novice in this area of hockey would be dramatically overstating my knowledge. Our discussion was as organic as any that I've experienced on this podcast. I wasn't digging deeper into a subject I'm familiar with. This was learning on the fly, a conversation that revealed information I hadn't even considered on several fronts. I'm legitimately fascinated by how players in today's world handle the mental part of the sport. Dr. Alicia Nasser is my best new Instagram follow of the season, and it's not even close. I hope you enjoy our talk that only scratches the surface as to how hockey people stay fit between the years. I was introduced to your background and uh, and what you're doing by a friend in the National Hockey League, and then I started following on Instagram, and it's fascinating to go through. But I don't know about your journey. So give me your background and all the letters that go with your name. Okay, so I have a, I'm Alicia Nasser. I have a PhD in uh, behavior analysis. So applied behavior analysis is a subdomain of psychology, and it's focused more on a behavioral interpretation of human behavior, organism behavior. And the focus is on the contingencies and the variables in our environment that influence our behavior. So this shows up in hockey specifically. I mean, it shows up everywhere, of course, uh, because human behavior is happening all around us, but it shows up specifically in hockey when we talk about stats, performance-based objectives, um, and then thoughts and emotions, because those are actually also considered behaviors. So um, my doctorate degree is in behavior analysis, which is a subdomain of psychology. And then um, I'm also an international behavior analyst, which just means I, I can practice behavior and analytic services throughout the entire world in different countries. Um, and how I got here to answer your question So I've been in the field for over 10, 12 years, and I actually started working with individuals with autism because I had mentioned before we hopped on that my brother has autism. So that's how I got interested in human behavior. And then also too, you know, there's always pieces of us where we're trying to figure out our own behavior. And so that's how I kind of got into, not kind of, that's how I got into the field. Um, But my whole life had been focused around autism because of my brother, where I was like, I want to keep doing this, but I need something different. And I also found that with the general population, it's like pulling teeth to get people to do the thing that will help them. But with NHL players, they want the edge and they want the thing that's going to make them different or give them a little bit edge over the next guy, help them scale a little faster, their stats increase a little bit better or whatever the case might be. And I was introduced to somebody about four seasons ago, four NHL seasons ago, who said, you know, the hockey world needs what you do. And I was a little shocked because I came to my attention that the NHL maybe specifically had been a little bit archaic and late to the game when it came to behavioral or mental health talk and chatter. And so um, he put me in touch with a couple of players who played in the NHL and from there it took off running and, and I just kind of been going with it since. And it's been really rewarding and, and a really great way to apply my training, my clinical training to um, specifically hockey. So I only work with, with hockey players, which is Another thing that I have found to be really rewarding as well, because hockey is a whole different beast, especially the NHL. Do you have a background in hockey? Like, do you have any? Oh, actually, I was a gymnast. So I was at. No, I was a gymnast. My father was a gymnast. Um, I was 
training really heavily in gymnastics, but that was way back when, <laughs> but no, no. I mean, I'm from Michigan. So hockey town, that kind of counts a little bit. Right. But other than that, that's all I got going for. You me. sound like you're a Canadian. I've, I've been around a rink. So it's, it's, it's fine. Like that, that's what we all do in, in, in Canada. Uh, so right. it almost gives you uh, just a, a fresh look, like an open look at, at hockey. What, what was the thing that grabbed you about? And by the way, when you said uh, archaic and, and hockey, I think that's all sports. Like it's been True. such a, a, a late gathering around this, but I think it's such a massive part of athletes now, uh, whether it's baseball or, or football, basketball, like the getting ready for sure. the big game. But yeah, on, on the idea of when you first approached hockey, what was the thing that grabbed you instantly? Yeah, that's a great question. Somebody asked me that the other day in another interview. And there are two things. Number one is the love and dedication. And I say these words as if they're so cliche, but a lot of, like a lot of cliches are true. The love and the dedication that players have for the sport of hockey. Like I have never seen a group of guys love and care so much about playing and wanting ice time so much. And when I say that, it might sound egotistical, but it's not. It's like they want ice time because they want to be able to contribute to the team and they want to help the team. And so a lot of times with the players that I work with, we'll do post-game breakdowns and, and what have you. And the frustration comes when there's a lot of variables, but one of the reasons is when they couldn't contribute to helping the team. And so the, to answer your question, one of the main things that really grabbed me was the, the dedication, the love, and just this admiration for the sport that they play, where I was like, this is so cool. Like, and you know, you don't really find that you find it with uh, pro athletes for sure. And at elite level, but there's something about hockey and, and NHL players. You're like, this is a different beast. These are different. These are humans in their own league, literally and figuratively. And then the second thing is the level of compete. So it kind of brought out in me a competitiveness that I had always had when I was younger, but then when my gymnastics career ended, uh, I played tennis and, and at golf, uh, just getting into that. So we won't go too far into golf, but I'm, you'll never tennis. figure that one out. <laughs> no, it's, I no. Know. That, that one's a lot. My, my for everybody. instructor's like, don't you do this for a living? I was like, I don't want to talk about it, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I've always been competitive, but, uh, working with NHL players brought out that competitiveness in me again. It, you know, brought it to bear. And I love the intensity of the schedule. Now, now at this time of the year, when we're recording this, I'm like, all right, is the season over yet? Like, what are we doing here? We didn't even make playoffs yet. We still have like two more weeks. Um, so I kind of feel as though I am a player with the players. Cause I go through the highs and lows with them. And that really um, was something that, you know, grasped my attention and really glued me on to this area specifically in this niche of, of athletics. I wrote down three reasons why I think a player would come to you. Okay. Uh, and I don't know whether they're accurate or not and, and be at like hammer me if, 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 if it's wrong, but the first one would be confidence or level of play, uh, okay. the coach, uh, or big moments. Are those in the sphere or if not, what are they? Okay. I'm thinking confidence level of play. When you say um, the coach, like frustration with the coach. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, you know what, that is very common. I'm not going to go in the order that you laid them out, but I will say that is very common with, um, but it's usually more common with an AHL player who just got called up and perhaps he's in his first year in the NHL. Whereas with some of the vets that I work with, it's not as common because they're vets. And so they have a little bit more exposure and they know how to navigate those interactions. Mm -hmm. um, however, the frustration with the coach usually is, um, so to answer your question, yes, that is one um, of I'm not getting the ice time that I want, or I'm a healthy scratch and I don't know why, or I've been producing, but now I'm a healthy scratch. So I, there's a discrepancy here. So that is, but it's actually not the most common reason. The most common reason is, was the first one you said confidence remind me? Your confidence and level of play. So they okay. kind of go hand in hand. So actually I'll tell you the most common reason or that a player would come in this position is because they go... I'm stuck. I'm getting stuck in my head and I want to get out of it. Like they, they go, I know I'm not playing at the level that I could be playing. And I don't know where that part of me went. I don't know where that version of a player of me went. And I mm -hmm. usually know exactly where it went. Once they tell me a little bit, like, I don't have to know a lot to know. 
And it's usually high expectations and they come from usually an environment where they were the guy playing the top guy, top score, top, whatever their save percentage was, what have you. And then they're not the top anymore. Doesn't mean they won't get there. They will be, or they can be, they just lost it because of nerves, expectations and all of that. So that's actually the main reason that could coincide with confidence to, to your point. Um, and then you said coaches, which we just described a bit. And then the third one remind me was big, big moments. Mo what do you mean by that? Like playoff time Oh, or, or you're, you've got, uh, you've been called up and there, it's a big opportunity for you. Yeah, no, it's, a, that's actually, it would be more so when they've already been called up and they're not producing or playing for the reasons mm. why they were called up. So the big moment usually has already happened. And then the outcome was not what they wanted. Then they call it. I'm like, listen, we can put fires out. We don't even have to put fires out when we're in them. We can get ahead of the fire before it starts. So that's actually, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's what I advocate for. And a lot of the players that come to me are actually players who are doing really great. They just don't want to get into a place where they have to put out a fire. Really? Yes. And so and I assume I assume people are coming to you because they're stuck or they're falling behind. They are. And I also see an equal amount of NHL players who are actually doing rather well. And they really could keep doing well without um, the work that we do together. But they're smart. As, as I would define them as really smart players because they know hey, the same way I need to strengthen condition or a skills coach or whatever the case might be, I also need a I need mental training and I need this piece to keep going. So I think those are perhaps some of the smartest players, the ones that are doing well and maybe you would think don't need to be working with someone who along the lines of what I do, but they do because they know it'll optimize their game. And as we know, the NHL, it's a game of inches. It's about winning those puck battles. It's about the game within the game. So if you want every little inch, you need to do the thing that's going to give you an edge over the next guy. Would you agree? Yeah, I'm just fascinated and impressed by that. You, you and I both. I'm I, I'm so proud of them. Those are those are. I mean, I'm proud of every player I work with, but those are perhaps some of the ones where I go, "Wow!" Because you didn't have to work with me. You didn't need to and um, approach me and say, "Hey, like, tell me more about what you do." Or you could have just kept going. But I think those are the ones who were for, first of all will have a lot of longevity in their career. Second of all, will probably avoid injury a bit, mental or physical and emotional injury. And then I also think they, those are the ones who guys on the bench will say are better teammate in the room. He's a great teammate. Coaches know that they, they're reliable and consistent in their game and scouts and coaches. Those are the two things scouts and coaches tell me that they look for is consistency and reliability. This could be a five-part series. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to bounce around because I'm going to cover the, the periphery a little bit more without specifics. But when you say sure mental injury. What do you mean by that? Yeah. The emotional injury. Yeah. So yeah. this is a common one where perhaps uh, I'll even, I'm just thinking of a player that I work with right now who's in the NHL and had an amazing start to the season, played a bunch of games in the NHL, got sent back down for whatever reason. Um, and then it's called up again now and is playing, doing amazing. And to him though, the emotional injury that stays stuck in his mind is a mistake, uncharacteristic mistake he made perhaps late in a third period. And as he sees it may be the reason, you know, he was sent back down. And this happens with every player I work with. There's this one uncharacteristic moment on the ice where something happens and to them, it's an emotional injury. And so we have to repair that injury, that wound, the same way that we do with a physical wound, because although it may not be the reason, and it probably is not the reason why maybe they were sent back down. Usually it's injuries, roster changes, things like that. And the lineup, we still have to repair it because it's, it sticks and it hurts. And we remember the pain of it the same way we would remember the physical pain of taking a hit against the board or the way we'd remember an open ice hit, which, you know, so it's as though we have to repair that emotional injury. Just think about it as another way to phrase memory. It's like synonymous with your memory, rem remembering the pain and the brain remembers the brain will always gravitate towards the negative more than it will the positive because the brain is the, re the purpose of the brain is to, so for survival. It's to, to be aware of threat. And so we always kind of go towards the negative a little bit. So what I when I work with NHL players, it's about, hey, let's not so much weigh this way towards the negative. Let's bring it back to like, what are actually the great things that you're doing when you're producing? What's actually happening here on the ice? Because we need to do more work in weighing that way, leaning that way, than we do with, towards the emotional injury. And when you heal that emotional injury, then you see players just, they take off running while skating in this case. I see players who are hesitant 
or they're afraid to make a mistake. They they play the whole game to avoid making that yeah. one mistake that'll get them in trouble. How do you work with players on that side and how do you get past that? Yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned that because that is also one of the most common reasons and I didn't even bring that up. So thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> um, it will happen. It's a, so interesting, right? Because the reason why they were drafted in the first place, the reason why they're an elite player in the best league in the world is because of their stylistically how they play, their level of compete, their level of intensity. Perhaps they're amazing skaters, which they all are. Um, well, mostly. Um, and the those variables that make them an amazing player are the very things they stop doing when they start second guessing themselves or don't want to lose the position that they're in. Yeah. So the, the reasons why they're there will be the things that they stop doing. Those grip their stick a little tighter. They won't, they'll start playing more defensively when they're an offensive player because right. they're in survival mode. And that I see a lot. And I'm like, what are we doing here? This is not who you are stylistically. You know, you were, you were drafted because you attack and you drive to the net and you are really great at playmaking and you read the puck well, and none of that you'll see because they hold back. So the hesitation is the biggest thing. So to answer your question, how do we work through it? You want to know what I do? I'll tell you the secret sauce. <laughs> I, I would love to know that because the, I, I've sent you a message about how a lot of what you talk about is transferable to life too. 100%. So people listening to this may not play professional hockey, probably don't play professional hockey, but how do you get unstuck in your head like that? Yeah, and I'm, I'm glad you asked. So really, this is where you can start. You can make draw, get a piece of paper, you draw a line down the middle, and you make two columns. One is what do I gain? And the other is what do I lose? What do I gain by hesitating? What do I lose by hesitating? Now, the lose part, it, I'm thinking of every NHL player I've worked with, and they will start, they'll give me the generic, well, I lose, they'll give me like a few different generic answers. And then, nice I'll, exactly. Yeah. And then they'll give me a couple more. And then I say, okay, well, what about losing self respect? What about losing respect from your coach? <laughs> what, if, yeah. what about, yeah. <laughs> no, I just said, <laughs> what about losing, um, Points, literally and figuratively, opportunity, chances for development, chances to play against other top talent. So there are these out of the box reasons and variables that you might lose that players aren't initially aware of on a conscious level. So what I do with them is I make them aware of the things that they're less aware of. And when they look at it, they go, oh, oh yeah, this is way too long of a list of things I'm losing. And, and I didn't even think of these things. And it's really self-respect is the main one. Cause when you put it, when you phrase it that way, I'm like, you're actually going up against yourself, you're becoming your own opponent. You already have five on five. You already have enough opponents. You don't need another one. And then when we go to the, what do you gain column? That's where they usually have nothing. They're like, I got nothing for you. And I'm like, think about it. And I'll give them a few more minutes. They go, I got nothing. I'm like, what do you gain by hesitating? What do you gain by playing down a level? And they really got nothing because they don't, no one's really ever asked them that question before. And they've never asked themselves that question. I'm like, listen, you gain comfort and you gain a little bit of, um, control, but it's kind of pseudo control of the situation. Like you think you're controlling it by, by playing it safe, but you're really not. And then also you gain a little bit of comfort because you feel as though you're being more reserved and you're hesitating and holding back. So you gain comfort. Maybe you're not going to take as many hits, or maybe you're, uh, you know, that if you pass rather than shoot, you likely won't make a mistake. Therefore you don't look as bad. But then we get from there, we segue into a discussion about high risk, high reward and taking risks on the ice. What are the top three things that players come to you if I'm if mine aren't top three? They are. Well, so they are the hesitation piece that you mentioned, the confidence uh, piece that you mentioned as well, um, really becoming their own opponent. And then the third reason um, they lose their love and passion for the game, probably as a result of number one and number two. Is that easy to fix? Yeah. Well, if they're willing to do the work, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that's why I'm really grateful that I've had success with the players that I work with rather quickly. Because that's one thing, too, to go back to your very first question at the top of this, the onset. You asked, like, what, you know, really gravitated me towards working with hockey players. And the thing is, they don't need much. They'll do it. You just give them the thing and they'll do the thing. And if they see the reward from it, they contact reinforcement and they notice, oh, wait, if I just if I get buy in from them through trust and they do the thing, 
it's more likely than not they will reap the rewards of of, of doing the work. So, is it is it a pop in, talk to you and pop out and then go back in, or is it a regular correspondence with you? Yeah, no, I'm glad. The, another great question. So I only work with players generally every now and then I will have a player who I'm like, you don't need me a ton. Let's just do one, two hour session, but no, it's a six month commitment because okay. I'm committed to them. And I want the same commitment back as I'm committed to their career. And I want to see the growth. And we know that like anything, it requires consistency. And in fact, I would say more so than physical training, the emotional mindset, mental training requires consistent touch points, consistent reminders. So I work with players on a six month minimum basis. Um, and we have a session every two weeks, but then I'm in between sessions, I'm in touch with them all of the time. So they get ongoing support in between and always on game days before and after. If they need some players, they don't need all that touch point, but most do and they get in the habit of it and they find it to be beneficial. So we just keep rolling with it. So there's correspondence before and after each game. Yeah. Yeah. So I, before every game, I give every player a warm up, a mental like mindset warm up. Um, and it's focused on behavioral objectives. And usually it will have to do with two things. Number one, what are we talking about in session that we want to improve tactically and emotionally? And then number two, um, what did we, what were you the, so we do something called the peaks in a pit after every game pits are what didn't go so well peaks went what, what went well so in their warm ups i'll incorporate the pits from the last game so, and we'll also incorporate stylistically how, your opponent what are two things you need to look out for for example if you're like let's say the bruins last night played carolina if you're playing carolina what are two things that you need to look out for stylistically to be aware of because if you're more aware of it you're more, you don't have to second guess or think about it when you're on the ice. And we know at the NHL level, usually they're playing so quickly that they're not thinking about it. But if you warm the brain brain up to prepare for what your opponent is going to do, um, you're more likely to execute it with efficiency and with uh, success. Like hockey schedule is crazy. How, oh, you're telling how, how me. You, yeah, exactly. <laughs> how, how do you have time for all of that? I'm legitimately <laughs> fascinated by that too. So when it's West Coast players, I'm up. I'm because I'm in the East Coast. When it's yeah. West, when it it's a West Coast game or West Coast players, if you know they're on the road trip, um, I'm up late. Everyone, I the one thing I wish is just everyone didn't have a seven o'clock Eastern puck drop. That would really help me out because I'm, <laughs> I have like five screens going at one time. Yeah. I'm like, come on. Um, you know, it's really just time management on my end, which I've I'm not going to say is perfect, but I've come a long way to really, you know. I, getting a doctorate degree, you have to have time management. You have to mm -hmm. figure it out somehow. So it's about time management. Um, it's also about, you know, my job is to teach these guys to not need me anymore. So when I, we get to a place in our- That's, in a, our, that's not a very good business model. It's not, but no. you know what? <laughs> it's not at all. But that's, the, that's also another piece of it is that when you do things for the right reasons, mm -hmm. when you when you're really aligned with your values and your morals, and you're not, you know, if I were just doing this because these are NHL players who have big contracts, any I would not be here right now. People would, you would sense the lack of care and the lack of, but I really deeply care because it's fun for me when they win, right? It's fun for me and it's great to see them love the sport that they love to play that they're so good at. It's really cool. Um, so if my goal is to teach them not to need me anymore and just to need some touch points. So sometimes depending upon where we are in the season, I'll have some players who have been with me for a while. We're towards the end of our six months, like maybe fifth month in, they don't need as much support, but so we can lay off a little bit where then I can give some other guys more support where they need it. And it ebbs and flows. Cause as you know, in the NHL teams and players go through ruts here and there. So. When is the right age? to get in touch with you or somebody that does what you do because parents will be listening going, Oh, this is great. I, I got to get on this uh, yeah. of my 14 year old of my 12 year old. So I do get a lot of parents who will reach out, you know, triple A and what have you, the younger yeah. guys and what have you. So I, I specifically, me personally, I work with, you know, 18 and up primarily AHL, NHL, some D1s, some USHL, and I have a few in the Alberta Junior League and in, in Canada, what have you. Um, however, I think context matters and it's person specific. So 
I could tell you it's there's never a bad time to start working with somebody. I don't think that there is. I think it the level of pressure I see the younger kids going through and I hear about is a bit um it's a bit shocking. So I think if you have a younger player who is playing at an elite level and that's the path they're going, definitely get them in touch with somebody who does this kind of work early on because it's a level of pressure that developmentally and cognitively throughout the chronological stages of development, a child is not necessarily equipped or expected to go through. Um, and then I think that, you know, it, another point that should be mentioned is it sometimes takes a little bit to find a good fit. You know, um, that's one thing where sometimes players can get a bit discouraged because they don't find the right person. Sometimes you just got to try a few and I get, they don't have the time for it. So the off season is a good time to start looking into that um, where it's like, how do I find somebody to work with? That's a good fit that understands me, that understands the culture, the hockey schedule, all of that, the lingo. Um, I don't think it's ever a bad time. Cause I think we should always all be, if we can and have the means interacting with someone who has an unbiased neutral um opinion and outlook on what it is that we do in our lives on the ice, off the ice. I also think it's important for parents who to, to also be working with someone. If you have a child who is uh, playing hockey at that level and going down that path where you think they'll be playing elite hockey for a while. Um, I have only a few, I have like three young ones that I take and they're going down that path. They will you know, most likely play in the NHL one day, but I require of their parents that they meet with me at least once every month, month and a half to do some parent training because that matters. Is there a position like, do more goalies reach out to you because that's such a mentally challenging position? You're all alone back there, the lonely end of the rink, or is it the superstars, or is it the the middle ground? A little bit you... of both. It's a little bit of both. I do have three goalies, four goalies right now that I work with, uh, but I actually have more centers that I work with. Baseball percentage is a thing, <laughs> so it gets yeah, them. yeah, 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 yeah. And I think turning the puck over uncharacteristically actually yes. has more of an impact than people would imagine. Um, yes, goalies are more cerebral and, cerebral and analytic in their way of thinking. So actually, sometimes they have more pushback. To, they'll push back more if their agent reaches out and like, is like, hey, I have a goalie. I want him to come see you. The goalies actually will be a little bit more pushed back because they're a little bit more pragmatic and analytic, and which is not a bad thing. That's how I think, actually. So then I got to kind of get them to see what it can do, but they're more pragmatic. So they go, but I want to know, I want to see the end result of how it's going to work. And that's not really something you can give somebody until they do the work to see objectively. It's not like, you know, physical training where you see a muscle grow. You can't see the brain emotional like change. Uh, well, we could, if we had scans actually, but that, <laughs> that I'll do it another year. Do coaches like you? Oh, I hope so. Cause I yeah. like them. <laughs> No, but you know what I mean? Like you're, yeah. you're working with their players and you're, you're giving them, uh, independence and, and thinking like, uh, what, what's the, what are you going to lose by making this play? And the coach is saying, Hey, you gotta, you gotta make this play. Yeah. Curious. So from what I can, from what I'm aware of, I think that they do. I, um, have players on my roster that play in the NHL where the, I don't believe that their coaches know that they're working with me, not for any reason, just because they independently reached out to me because uh, I'm not in house. So it's not necessarily like all coaches know that their players are working with me. However, um, coaches themselves will reach out to me because I work do with coaches. Yes. So I do a lot of work coaching coaches. So I work with coaches, scouts, and players. And I work with that and, so, and actually agents. So every now and then I will, not every now and then, it's actually a little bit more common um, where I'll help agents support their players. And then I work with coaches, coaching coaches on how to coach and then also how to navigate maybe a certain interaction with a player where they're, they're just having a difficult time. With scouts, I'll, I work with scouts um, on identifying potential talent and identifying and predicting talent and behavior. And then with players, it's a whole host of everything. Um, but coaches have reached out probably equally as frequently as uh, players do. So that has been really rewarding as well. And I think that's very admirable for a coach. That surprises me. Well, I have gained a lot of respect. I know people sometimes harp on coaches, but I've gained a lot of respect uh, for them. Because before I started working with coaches, I didn't realize the amount of pressure that they go through and the yeah. other variables that they take. And you want to know who else reaches out that surprised me big time? Refs, NHL refs. 
had n- no idea and no plan I, of going down that path. We, we but it makes sense. Like who's under more pressure than those guys? I, it was a shocker to me. And I'm like, wow, this is a whole nother area. We got to take it slow here. So how would you navigate that? Because like you talk about hesitancy, like that's a yeah. killer in, the, in in a ref's world. Yeah, you know, but to the same extent, it, it I would apply the same mechanism and framework that I do with players, which is self-assurance. So I have a lot of players who will shoot or they'll pass more than they shoot when they're shooters. And I'm like, why are we not shooting here? What's happening? And it's a lot. Is that the way you put it? Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, well, no, well, the way I put it is I'll say this. How's that working out for you? And they go, <laughs> and they go, uh, it's not. And I go, then why are we doing it? Let's do something else. You know, sometimes some comical relief brought into session really helps. And also when you just frame things a little bit more practical. So I'm also have some training in something called acceptance and commitment therapy and contextual behavioral science. And ultimately what that means is just really putting things in context. So I'm like, listen, why are we doing that? What, what's How's it working out? What was it working out for you? People will complain about the thing they're doing. And then when you ask them, so how's it working out? And they're like, well, it's not really. Then you go, okay, so why don't we try something different? Isn't the definition of crazy doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result? Yeah. And they go, oh yeah, you're right. And so, <laughs> so, um, but to the point about reps, it's really applying the same framework, which is self-assurance, being assured in the calls you're making, being assured of the calls that you're making, even in the face of adversity, in the face of pushback, in the face of pressure, same thing with players. Why are we passing more than we're shooting? If you're a shooter, you need to have, we need to get back in contact with the self-assurance and contact with that self-assurance, even when it's a high pressure moment, even when it's late in the third, even the game is tied, even when you have an opponent coming after you, who, you know, is really good with possession, you know, whatever the case might be. So frameworks are the same, but I adapt it based on the person. Is confidence a real thing? It depends who you ask. And it depends there if you're asking somebody in the psychology domain, their training, what they would say. In my so, business, we'll go, oh, he's feeling, he's confident. He's on he's yeah. on this, he's on this role. Mm-hmm. Is is that really why he's on a role? Or yeah. So I again, everything is context and person specific and situational. Mm-hmm. But the way I see it and the way I speak about it, and the language we use in session with players that I work with is not confidence, but more so self-assurance and self-esteem. Because here's the thing: if I say to you, he lost his confidence. That implies that confidence is something that is so inconsistent and something that can be gained or earned or given or it's here. I look at it that way. I I, I know, but we don't, I don't love that. Do we love that? I don't know. (laughs) That's the only way I know how to explain it. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm in therapy right now. (laughs) No. (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, not you and everybody else and, and myself as well, until I was like, this doesn't work because the way that a player describes their experience, if they describe their experiences as, as, hey, you know, I lost my confidence. Well, I'm like, well, we need something that's a bit more reliable and consistent, even when you turned the puck over, even when you didn't block that shot. And what is something that is more consistent, reliable, that sustains and is always present, even in the face of adversity, even when you're a healthy scratch, when you didn't get as much ice time, I would say self-esteem. Now, self-esteem exists on a spectrum. So you can have adequate self-esteem or inadequate, and that might shift on the spectrum depending upon those variables, ice time, how well you're doing, if you, you know, goals or assists or what have you. And I'm okay with that because I think that's a bit more realistic. Whereas if we say you have inadequate self-esteem because perhaps you didn't get as much ice time, that's, that's okay. It's reasonable. Now, if I say you lost all your confidence because you turned over the puck, now I'm like, now what do we do? We have nothing to fall back on. Right. Whereas if you always have some level of self-esteem existing on the spectrum somewhere, you then can engage in behaviors to move it in the direction you want it to go. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, it it does, and it takes me down another path because I'm always, I'm, as you're talking, I'm like going through locker rooms that I've been in in the past <laughs> where uh, I see this player in 2010 where he was the loud guy, and I wonder if he was the most the, the guy that lacked self esteem the most, and he was just being loud. And then I see the quiet guy who, uh, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Yeah, I, that's a really, I think I see, I think I'm hearing what you're saying that maybe perhaps self-esteem or the absence of self-esteem 
behaviorally looks different all of the time, depending yeah. on the person. And it might not look like what we think it is. Like oftentimes maybe the loud person might be covering up their in sense of inadequate self-esteem with that um, extrovertedness, perhaps maybe. Is that what you're kind of going yeah. Yeah, it, it, it sort of goes to you hear all the time captains. He's he's not the most vocal person, but he's a leader. Goes down my path of it's not always the loudest guy that's the most full of self esteem. No, you know what? You're so right. And I think what it is is I would say, and the guy, any guy that I work with will tell you this. Any player will say, it's the player who has a firm and solid sense of their values because I do a lot of work around values. Because values are like a compass. They guide our behavior. Values are not behaviors. Values are a, a, a set of variables that guide our behavior. So the guys that I work with, the, one of the very, it's usually the first or second session is values, ident um, values identification, getting a solid grasp of their values. And then, then they can behave in ways that align with their values. And what are really, values? What are some examples of, of values of a player? So like, let's say discipline, uh, mm -hmm. transparency, self-acceptance. So a really big one that we work on is self-acceptance. If you're going to beat yourself up after a game, if thoughts and thoughts are behaviors, and if you have co thoughts constantly of beating yourself up and how you didn't play good enough and you're a terrible player and all this and that, you don't deserve to be in the NHL, is that a behavior that aligns with your value of self-acceptance? No. So then we need to change the behavior. So that way it's more practical and they can see it. If transparency is a value of yours. Honest communication is a value of yours. Uh, for the listener who can't see this, I'm just holding up my thumbs up and the thumbs up emoji keeps popping up on the Zoom screen. So in any case- Is that uh, your Zoom that does that or- I don't know, but everybody? I'll tell- I don't know, but I'll tell you, I was on the, I was on a zoom call with a GM and NHL GM the other day and I did it. And I was like, I am so sorry. I don't know why this effect is. Like this. <laughs> um, but if transparency and honest communication is a value of yours and you're then not engaging in a conversation with your coach that, you know, you need to have to understand why you're not getting ice time. Are you engaging in a behavior aligned with your values? And then they go, no. Like, okay, well then let's do something about that. So if we, and you always fall back to your values, you then know how to get yourself out of some ruts. But circling back really quick, I would say that the player, even like to your point about captains, if they're not the most vocal, but they're if leadership is a value of theirs, then they'll engage in behaviors that align with that value of leadership. And that means to me as a behavior analyst that they have a behavioral repertoire, a set of behaviors that are really solid and they have trained over time and conditioned that they engage in these behaviors regardless of motivation because motivation isn't a thing it's it's more so behaving and behaving in behaviors <laughs> behaving in behaviors because that's your norm and that's your what you that's just what you do it's just the behaviors make up who you are behaviors make the person the person makes the player i was going to ask you before we shut down the whole confidence thing what was more important confidence or composure what, can I oh. substitute self-esteem? No, no, no. I, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's a play on words and it's all semantics. Um, I like that. What's better? Confidence? Oh, okay. I would say composure because a byproduct of composure would be confidence. Because you cannot be all rattled up in the mindset and your headspace in the middle of a game or in, in between periods or shifts and then also be confident because what that implies, this anxiety or this um, lack of feeling out of control implies that you don't have self-trust. You don't trust yourself and you don't have confidence because someone who is self-assured or confident, if we will here use that word, knows how to regulate their nervous system and get their heart rate down, knows how to reframe their thoughts. Now, this does not by any means mean they don't have self-doubt or they're not self-critical. They are. They know how to get themselves out of it quicker. So that way in 30, 40 second shifts, they can refocus and, and do what needs to happen on the ice much quicker and with uh, more success. Last one. And sure. I was saving this one because I, I wanted to end on a fun note. You had a <laughs> post the other day about singing during Oh, games. the song in your head. Yes. 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 Yeah. Tell yeah. The, the, the viewers <laughs> and listeners about an NHL player having a song in their head during a game and singing that and what the benefit, I'd never heard of it. If, if it wasn't coming from a professional, I'd say, what are we doing here? 
yeah, but yeah. talk me through it because it did it actually did make sense once you explained it you know it's so funny I also have an agent that I work with and he sends a lot of his players to me and he's like you know he was having anxiety because some of his players were like signed it was around the trade deadline mm. and he goes, I did that thing that you said in your post where I sang a song in my head I was like wow more people are really trying this out than I anticipated but what it is is you know uh, the thoughts, the mind, an untrained mind will really get the best of us, as we all know, especially for an NHL player. So, you know, to tell a player don't have the thought is not really easy. It's like, come on, Alicia, that's really difficult. Okay. So if you sing a song in your head, can you sing a song and like have a different thought at the same time? It's really hard to do. Like if you sing a song in your head or out loud to yourself, it's very hard to have self-critical or self-defeating thoughts of second guessing yourself. It's really hard to do that. So if you just sing a song, it's like those two things can't exist at the same time. If you sing a song at an NHL level, your body already knows what to do. You already know how to get back in that flow and just play your game. So singing a song really just lets the body then do the work to play the game that they already know how to play. And it's so funny. I'm glad you asked that because uh, two days ago, I had a, a player that I work with who's in a playoff contending team, or actually they just clinched a spot for the night for the playoffs. And he's like, hey, so I did that. I was like, what song did you sing? And it was like an old school Alan Jackson or Bob Dylan song, like one really old. And I'm like, that's the song you chose in that moment? Like it was in overtime. I'm like, that's who you chose? He's like, yeah, but it worked. <laughs> it's like, okay. I'm with you. And and songs that you would sing in your head are usually songs that would make you feel better, I would think. You know what? I never thought about that. But look at you. You could do my day job. That's a really, <laughs> that's a really good point, actually, too. Yeah. So you've got this this automatic great aura around you or, or feeling about you. At yeah. least that's what I think. I'm not going to sing a sad song in the middle of a, a game. Or you know, anything. that's a really good point. I'm going to turn that into a research project. Yeah. And and then you start grooving. Then you just start skating. Yeah. And you start just playing and you're zipping through guys and you're driving to the net. And hopefully it's all good. And the puck's I in love the back it. of the net. <laughs> Can we talk to you again sometime? Of course. <laughs> Of Please? course, but I'm going to start charging for session. <laughs> okay, I know I, we've been way too long here, and uh, no, no, I didn't, I didn't mean that. I meant because at the top of the hour, you guys were like, "We think we need session with you." Oh, producer Bob, <laughs> like producer Bob. he he's like nine clients in one. Trust me on that. Uh, oh no. Yeah, 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 producer Bob, and I, I'm about five, so it, it's all good. But uh, Alicia, <laughs> uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Can people get a hold of you? Do they just DM you if they want, or I know you're just NHL, uh, HL, like you're you're play to stack. But mm -hmm. is it okay if people reach out to yes. you? Yeah. So um, my Instagram is, handle is Dr. Alicia Nasser. I'm also on LinkedIn. I get a lot more um, GMs, coaches, and agents that'll reach out on LinkedIn. And then my the email that you can reach out to, which I'm okay giving this because it's a directly for this kind of a thing, is contact at alishanasser.com. Awesome so contact stuff. Contact at alishanasser.com and then um, somebody from my team will reach back out and anybody can reach out um, with any more inquiries or questions or services and all of that there. Players, refs, GMs, coaches. The whole me. gang's here. And Bob and I. <laughs> and Bob, <laughs> we're going to get the band together yeah. all one day. <laughs> Thanks, Alicia. This has been amazing. Of course. Thank you. We'll put the social media links and Alicia's email into the show notes. So Bob and I, much better people today, and we haven't played an NHL game this season. We were sending notes back and forth during the recording of that conversation. Alicia will say, hey, focus on what's in front of you. But uh, we were really excited about what we were learning as the conversation went on. And halfway through the chat, we were already planning a follow-up episode. That's true. There are so many more topics that I want to explore. And I also like chatting with someone who isn't about to make me feel like I'm asking a dumb question. I appreciate that, Alicia. I uh, hope you enjoyed the chat. Uh, please rate this episode. Let us know if you have a question or an angle that interests you on this topic. What's your reaction to this episode? Send me a DM or a reply on any of my social media accounts. Next week, we get back to the action on the ice. Uh, playoff races and jockeying for position will be in its final phase. Can't wait to see if Sid or Ovi get in where Connor finishes up. Talk to you next week. Going to go digest what I learned. Put it to good use. <laughs>